Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham. is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. Thank you. Well, here we are. And I'm so happy to be with you. Tuesday night is kind of special for me, and I hope it's special for you, because we can just kind of chit-chat about anything. <coughs> you know, this morning I, we were talking to the sisters at Lesson, and one of my little hobbies, I don't have too many of them. I don't have time for any of them, but once in a great while I like to read books on galaxies and quasars and comets and asteroids and it is phenomenal. You know, it hurts your head when you read about it because <laughs> it's so big. Something uh, 300 times the size of the sun. Well, you, you can't even, I mean, it just doesn't sink, you know? And now they say there's some kind of black denseness has awesome gravity to it and it's pulling the whole Milky Way. I thought, wow, that's what you call power. And then when you look at all oh, different kinds of stars and planets and these big asteroids or one big hunk of metal or a hunk of rock or, or snow, whatever. And they're huge. One 630 miles wide. What a rock, huh? Well, it's awesome really awesome. And then I was thinking that this God that we call Father, have the privilege of calling Father, uh, decided to send his son down here into this world that's so small. I was given a talk in New York one time and they said, do you ever see the Empire State Building? I said, yes, how can you miss it when you go to New York, you know? <laughs> said, well, would you like to go up? I said, nope. <laughs> well, would you like to go down? I said, yeah, I'd like to go down, but I don't want to go up. So we went down and they have a kind of museum there. And they had this wall it's a long, long hallway. It had this wall, and on this wall was painted the sun. Huge wall. Huge sun. So the instructions were to walk down this hallway and put your face as close to the wall as you could. Everybody looked kind of stupid, you know, standing <laughs> there. Against everybody like this, you know, against this wall. So I thought, well, what won't hurt? Well, it was my turn. I went up as close as you can get, and there was a tiny speck of blue. And it said, Earth. Whew. So small. 
compared just to the sun, let alone Jupiter and all the rest of them. And now the, the astronomers, you know, they're confounded every day. It's just all exciting to see them confounded. They finally threw Darwin out of the distance, and, and now they're seeing, realizing there is no end to this universe, what's beyond it. And, and you, you, you look and also wonder at a God so great, and then he came down here, Jesus, Son of God. And see, all that knowledge was in the mind of Jesus, because he was God. He never ceased to be God. And who was he around all day long with? You won't believe it. Fishermen. <laughs> I don't know if you've been around fishermen or fish, either one. <laughs> but it's not Chanel number no. five, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he calls these men to be leaders of his new church. Well, now just keep in mind the one who, who designed and, and created this universe with an act of his will. Let it be, and it was. Well, he came and walked like we do. And you know, <clears throat> the animal part of us is the dumbest of all animals. What do we walk, depending on how big your feet are? Oh, what is it, 12, 14 inches at a time? <laughs> and you're exhausted after a couple of miles. Now here's God who just out of nothing creates everything with an act of his will. I mean, it's power. And the angels transporting themselves with the speed of thought. I just want to know how gross we are. <laughs> compared, compared to God and his angels. Well, the amazing thing to me, I never cease to wonder at, is that this Jesus, Son of God, came born in a stable. He created many beautiful places in this whole wide world that would be awesome to be born in. And he's born in a smelly stable. Escapes from a king. Flees into Egypt. And his whole life he's kind of hunted down by the jealousy and the ambition of the scribes and Pharisees and the king. And he speaks and heals to the people. He, he raises the dead and, and exercises demons. Nobody's grateful. And then he has 12 men with him all the time who saw wonders, wonders. John, St. John said, if, if, we, if we recorded everything Jesus did, the whole world could not hold the books. Well, that God who created the universe was slapped in the face by a soldier. He had the power to melt him down, and he didn't. He was scourged, suffered everything anyone else would suffer who was scourged or crowned with thorns or spit upon. I knew an exorcist 
in my younger years. A very good exorcist. Exercised this woman and uh, took her weak. One of the demons that came out of her was the soldier who slapped the Lord. And he bragged about it. Hmm. Well, that God who suffered all of that died and rose on his own power humiliated himself even more than that by the Eucharist. By allowing another man with awesome gift from God that we call holy orders to consecrate and, and he obeys. He obeys the creature and he comes and he lives with us and we'll be there at the end of time in a little wafer about that big. That awesome. Can you can you even imagine that? He does all that, he did, he continues to do all of that. And we still don't understand how much he loves us. Isn't that odd? And I think if we understood that one thing, how much he loves you, how much he loves me, if you understood that one thing, we'd be saints overnight. Why? Because nothing would be hard. We would compare what he did and what can be hard in my life compared to what he suffered for me, for you. And sometimes I think that's a hindrance to some of you because you are so imperfect. <laughs> oh, even we try, we mess it up, you know? We're imperfect. Most of the things we do are imperfect. Now, when Jesus was on earth, he taught us a great lesson. He taught us that he came for the sinner, not the virtuous. He came for you because you are imperfect because sin comes easy to you, and sometimes you don't have the willpower to say no. But you see, if you understood the awesomeness of God and all his power and all his wonder, and he comes down to our level, and he gets hungry, and he would never feel hungry. If I was never hungry, I would never want to feel hungry. Because he loves you so much, he wanted to feel what you feel when you're hungry, when you're thirsty, when you fast, when you're humiliated, when someone does you in. He wanted to feel, how do you feel? I don't know anybody that loves anyone that much. He wanted to know. And this imperfect being, that's you and me and all of us, he did it for us. That's why you should never despair, because you're imperfect. And, and when we sin, he taught us another lesson. The woman was uh, caught, they said in the scriptures, in adultery. That, that thing always burns me up. <laughs> I want to know what happened to the guy. You know? <laughs> I never understood that. I don't have any problem with any doctrine. I don't have any problem with any of the scriptures except at one point. <sighs> they were caught in adultery. It takes two people to have an adulterous affair. Where did he go? <laughs> I think you feminists have something going on that level. <laughs> what happened to him? We'll know in eternity. I hope I'm looking down. 
Ketika <laughs> But you know, doesn't that doesn't make you wonder? The men don't wonder, you know, they're glad he got away. You don't see any of the men here wondering, oh, yeah, what happened to him? All the women are saying, yeah, what happened to him? Anyway, that is my only scriptural gripe. Anyway, this poor woman is shaking and she knows she's about to be stoned. And they brought her to the Lord because I always thought in my most charitable moments, I have thought it was a frame up, you know? They knew this man and they say, why don't you just do this little thing for us and then we'll grab you and you go away and we'll grab her and we'll bring her to Jesus. That's the nicest thing I can think happened. <laughs> anyway, they came with an opera, hoping for an opportunity to humiliate the Lord and embarrass him. You're talking about the same God who created the entire universe. <laughs> And the amazing thing is that that same God kept them in existence to torment him. Mm. If I had that kind of power, I'd straighten the world out real quick. <laughs> like that. <laughs> anyway, thank God I don't. <laughs> but, They brought him to Jesus and they said, this woman was caught in adultery. The law says we should stone her. What do you say? Oh. The Lord didn't answer a word. Now this is the nice part about this scripture. All you feminists have a ball right now. The Lord there's sand all over the place, you know. Then he takes his finger and he starts writing names. <laughs> the Pharisee looks down and sees his name. <laughs> Off he goes. <laughs> then he races it and he does. April 25th. <laughs> I put that in. <laughs> That's what I would have done. <laughs> So he looks down and sees his name and a date, and he walks away. So that whole crowd of men walk away. There's nobody there but this poor, adulterous woman. He looks up, he says, has no one condemned thee? She said, no one, Lord. Lord, she said. He said, neither will I. Now, most of you put the period right there. That's what's wrong with you, you see. Don't put a period in Scripture where it isn't. He says, neither will I. Go and sin no more. What an awesome, wonderful, merciful, compassionate Lord. The Pharisees were most imperfect because they had hypocrisy in their heart. It's a, just a lot of imperfection here, sinful even. They wanted to trick our Lord. They humiliated this woman. And they tested the Lord. 
Our Lord was compassionate on her because she was sorry. He saw her heart, just like he saw their hearts. He could read their minds. He read it, their entire life was always before him. He had compassion. A lot of you have committed adultery. And you haven't gone to confession either. How can you read this and not go to confession? You'll hear the same thing, go and sin no more. But you see, this woman didn't confess anything. The whole thing was public. And the Lord had mercy on her. He knew her heart, and he knew the hearts of the men who brought her there. Never despair because you're imperfect. And I know what you're saying. Yeah, well, I try hard, but I do the same thing over. That's all right. <clears throat> The saints had their problems. The saints had their imperfections. The saints had their passions that they had to overcome. Now, imperfection is imperfection. There's no such a thing as worldly imperfection and spiritual imperfection. If you're imperfect, you're imperfect. Some are spiritual, yes. How are you spiritually imperfect? Well, if you're living a good life and you brag about it, <laughs> if you're holy, you don't have to go around telling everybody. If you're fasting, the Lord said, what did you do in secret? The Father will reward in secret. So we don't have to tell anybody, I love Jesus. It shows. You don't have to say anything about not loving Jesus because it shows too. You go around telling dirty jokes. It's like swearing, you know. I think men think it's a manly thing to do. It isn't. It's a stupid thing to do. Because you take God's, you either have a very low vocabulary that you don't know what to say, or you think this is the only way to express it. We have to look at Jesus. And say you swear, I had a, a we, we built a shrine in Canton. And, uh, our little truck driver, I tell you, every other word he would let go. And they'd say, oh, excuse me, sister, excuse me. <laughs> so finally I said to him, look, why don't you make a resolution you're not going to swear for a whole week? A whole week? I said, yeah. You know, get a few more words in your vocabulary. <laughs> oh, I'll cry. Thank you. So we came back after a week because they worked for us on weekends in building this shrine to Our Lady. And I said, well, how would you do? Perfect, he said. I said, perfect, good for you. You didn't swear. He said, no. Well, no, I didn't. I said, fine. He looked at me, he said, the hell I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you just swore. <laughs> well, I tried. <laughs> okay. See, that's the way some of your imperfections are. You're trying, in the very time you're trying, you mess it up. So what do you do now? Okay. 
I did what I thought Jesus would have done. I said, look, try again. Try again. And think of Jesus first. I think if we did, all of us did that. You know your fault. You know when a certain person comes your way, you start getting hot right under the cup. And they haven't said anything. They haven't done anything. Just looking at their face. <laughs> you know that. Pray. Start praying right there. Jesus, help me. See? Now, if you fall, repent right away. Don't wait. Don't think about it. Don't scold yourself. <clears throat> You want to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jesus. I fell again. And what do you do after that? Repair for it. If you were impatient with somebody, or you were arguing with somebody, or you were disobedient, or you were anything, then you must repair for that by doing the opposite to someone else. If you're unkind, be kind to someone. Do something nice. Are you always going to be imperfect? Yeah. St. Paul Francis de Sales said your imperfection will die 15 minutes after you do. Is it hopeless? No, no, no. Your imperfections are steps to holiness. Did you know that? They make you humble. They make you more determined to be better the next time. They give you self-knowledge. You know that you have a temper or you're very impatient or you're very hateful or you're unkind, unloving, all the things we are. You know that. If you have a problem with drinking, don't accept an invitation to a cocktail party. <laughs> You're not going to stand there with ginger ale in your hand. <laughs> so you, you put yourself in temptation. I can handle it. Three hours later, you're on the floor. <laughs> it handled you. You didn't handle it. The purpose the Lord allows us to retain our imperfection is in an overcoming I choose between God or myself or the world or the enemy. How do you belong to satanic groups? Oh. Get out. Get out. Some of you are very worldly. Say, well, what's that? We live in the world. Oh, yeah, it says in this good book. You are in the world, but not of the world. There's a big difference. I can live in the world. I am in the world. As a religious, I'm in the world. In business, when I conduct business for this network, I am in the world. And I separate the world and religion real fast. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't try to do me in if I were you. <laughs> did I tell you the time? I think I did, but it bears repeating. We got new audience all the time. <laughs> We used to be in a peanut business, the sisters and I. This is in the 60s. And we did very well. I forget how um, oh, we had, com we had um, machines that bagged and put the peanuts in. And our sisters did, I think, uh, two, three hundred pounds a day. It was a lot of hard work, hot work. And we had big orders. And one was from Daytona Racetrack. 
And we had little peanut bags and we made them holy peanuts. We had St. Michael's peanut. They were about this big. <laughs> Had, and Sister Mary Rafe drew a little angel with a cute little guy, and that was on the cover, on the <clears throat> front. And so we did that a couple of years. And so the concessionaire was changed. So the new concessionaire comes to me, and he says, um, you make great peanuts. I said, well, thank you. He said, uh, I'm the new concessionaire. That's how you do it. He said, uh, it'll cost you a little advertising fee. I said, advertising fee? He said, yes. I said, you mean kickback? <laughs> you look like a nun says kickback. <laughs> he said, no, we don't call it that. He said, we call it advertising. <laughs> I don't care what you call it, but that's what it is, kickback. I, I don't pay kickback. He said, well, then you'll lose our business. I said, sweetheart, when I say that, it's coming. <laughs> I said, sweetheart, if I'm going to hell, it's not going to be on a peanut. <laughs> oh, Lord, dear Lord. So we lost the business and we had to sell the machinery and everything else because we, we just didn't make a living anymore. It was a lesson for us. We made an imperfect decision to deal with the world. But when the world came in, we got rid of it. Because we cannot be of the world. If you're a Catholic and you're a Catholic Christian and you're an ordinary Christian, any, any kind of Christian, you cannot bend to the lack of ethics in the world. And if you say everybody does it, that doesn't make it right. you got to be, your imperfections are there, and they are those awesome, wonderful stepping stones that we grow in virtue. I can say no to myself. I can say no to sin. I can say no. <coughs> Excuse me. And I have that, that awesome privilege of saying no. I have that willpower given to me by God so that I can make a choice. What a wonderful like, uh, privilege it is for us with our imperfections to make a choice for Jesus. I say no to myself. I say no to the world. I say no to sin, occasions of sin. Now, the very thing that should drag you down raises you up. See, isn't that easy? And if you keep in mind how awesome God is, then you will appreciate the Eucharist. It's very difficult for me to understand why so many priests and religious do not teach the real truth about the Eucharist. See, when you realize who God is, even if you realize a tiny, tiny bit, and then he came down and humiliated himself and because he loves us. He wants to be with us. He wants to be a part of me. And so I go to communion. I receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus. If you deny that and you keep people away from that sacrament, oh, oh. I wouldn't want to be there when you see him face to face. 
because you see, you, you refused to acknowledge the awesome presence of God's humility and love for me and you. He wants to be there. He wants to be in that chapel. He wants to be in that church so the people can come to him. Come to me, he says. When you take him away or you hide him in a closet and the people can't get to him, do you know what you do? Mm. So, please, never despair. You're called by God by your very existence to be holy. And don't settle for anything less. That's such a shame. Now, we have a call. Hello? Hi. Hello. Where are you my from? Name, my name's Gracie. And how old are you? Seven. How wonderful. What's your question, sweetheart? Um, the... What can I do for you? I want you to pray for my class because they're making my first, uh, their first communion. Your first communion? Mm -hmm. How wonderful. Well, what day is it? March 24th. Wonderful. That's the day before the Annunciation. What a wonderful, beautiful gift. Why don't I say a prayer for you and all the class? Would you like that? Yeah. Okay. Lord Jesus, this child knows that she receives you in the Eucharist, Lord. And all those children in that class will know. Because she said, I will receive Jesus. I ask that you bestow upon each one of this, this class that, that's going to make their first communion a very special grace. Let them know, Lord, how much you love them. And give them that remembrance of that day that they can carry the joy of that day with them all the days of their life. So that we may all appreciate your love for us. Amen. We have another call. Hello? Yeah, hi. This is Sherry Muller, Angelica. I love, you're just beautiful. Thank you. Um, first of all, I was born and raised totally Catholic. Uh -huh. Recently, well, two years ago, I um, went through and committed myself totally to the Lord. Good. Born again Christian. Mm -hmm. My question is, when I was raised totally as Catholic, um, when I go through the Bible and I read and it does say you must be born again. Yeah. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. When I was raised Catholic, it, they didn't really bring it up that much as far as why you should be born again and, and so forth. My other thing is, is that when you go, when you, when you sin, you go to confession to confess our sins yeah. um, to, to the priest. Why, why is it that we have to go to our priest when we have the Lord right in our hearts? And, and what, every day you say your prayers at night or, or whenever, <clears throat> he's right there. He's in your heart. You just need to confess right there and repent your mm. sins. Well, uh, we do this because God, in, Jesus instituted the sacraments. They, we didn't make them up ourselves. That's why we can't add to them and we can't take away from them. You see? So now, when our Lord said, who sins you shall forgive, you shall forgive. They are forgiven. Who sins you shall retain, they are retained. So he gave that power to the priests. Now, our Lord is a great psychologist. He knows, and you know, you need to hear with the very senses you sin with that you have been forgiven. You do not go to confession to a man. You go to confession to Jesus. He gave the apostles and all those after them the power to forgive sin. You need to hear. I absolve you. It isn't a man who absolves you. It is Jesus. 
Why do you think so many people go to psychologists and psychiatrists? Most of them need to go to confession. <laughs> That's where they need to go. They've had an abortion, they can't get over it, they sit on that whatever they sit on, and it cost them $45, $50 an hour. <coughs> and that psychologist or psychiatrist cannot forgive. He can try to talk them out of guilt. They need to hear from the voice of Jesus, I forgive you. Now they're born again. I think it is our fault that we don't understand, that we don't explain to our people what it means to be born again. You were born again at baptism. Here's this little baby, it's just a human being with a soul and crying and yelling and screaming, doesn't know beans. <laughs> Only thing it expresses is hunger. But that little baby, after baptism, has within it the very God who created it. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that's born again. Now, the apostles were born again. What does that mean? It means a metanoia, a total change. You cannot live, you cannot read, rather, the lives of the saints and not know that St. Augustine, believe me, was born again. <laughs> we call it conversion. They call it born again. If you're talking about feelings, well, we got saints that went and crawled up and raised up into the sky and into trees and into ceilings and <laughs> We raise the dead and we heal the sick and exercise demons. Read the lives of the saints. And believe me, you see some born again people. Mary of Egypt was a prostitute at 12. Went into the desert. She got so holy. People came in droves just to ask her prayers. You call it more to get. We call it conversion by the power of Jesus. We have another call. Hello? Hello, Mother Angelica. I'm Where JC, are you? and I'm calling to ask you. Um, I'm a Catholic, and I have a circle of friends who are what they call just spirit-filled Christians, mm -hmm. and I go to a weekly meeting they have. It's just like a little prayer group type of thing yes and i want to know is that wrong for me to do that uh, or should i maybe be concentrating on a catholic meeting of some kind thank you well let me say this and i say it realizing and you realize and if you don't i'm telling you that i would say 75 percent of our whole network is not catholic I don't demand it, and I couldn't find enough Catholics to run this network anyway. <laughs> when we began, they weren't too much in favor of helping us. So you just get you know, the people who came, came knowing they came to Catholic Network, and they have worked very hard and very wonderful, and I love them, and they love me. But we must love each other. As Christians, we are a scandal to the world because we do not love each other. That's one thing. I think it would be better for you to go to a Catholic prayer group. Why? Because there you will receive, hopefully, not always, but hopefully, perhaps a mass, a rosary, teaching and I don't find fault with you going to a Protestant prayer group providing there's not the teaching there that's going to change your mind and heart what I'm saying is it's wonderful but you have to be extremely careful 
that you don't put yourself in temptations of doubt mm -hmm. where they may criticize the church or criticize you at that point you must leave because we work with people of all faith and no faith and people who are Hindus and Muslims and every kind of religion or non-religion are witnesses to love them where they are and how they are. But we're also obliged, each one of us, to preserve our faith and not to put ourselves into a temptation or a place where my faith may be in jeopardy by those who create doubts in my mind. If you're talking of an ordinary prayer group where you pray together and read the scriptures together, fine. But if it comes to a point where it's a matter of defending your faith, then I would leave. We have another call. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? Uh, Bay City, Michigan. My name is Pat. And what is your question? I have a question. If you could give me a brief idea or overview of the book of Revelation from a Catholic perspective. And also, if you... <laughs> mm, if that you, is a real task. Go ahead, honey. Uh -huh. And if you could give me or recommend a book to me on um, purgatory with biblical references. Oh, we got a lot of books on purgatory. I give you a lot of biblical references. You got a pencil? Huh? Yep. Whoa. <laughs> Mark 9:48, Sirach 737, 1 Corinthians 3:14, Luke and Matthew 12:32. Now, the book of Revelations, you want it short. <laughs> <laughs> Short. Well, the book of Revelations, number one, is a symbolic book. But it says a lot. Most of all, it describes, don't you hate stuff in books? <laughs> okay, I'm safe now. It describes for you heaven, for one thing. All of you that wonder what heaven looks like. There's another one. <laughs> you need to read the book of Revelations. It says here, the person sitting on the throne looked like a diamond and a ruby. There was a rainbow encircling the throne and it looked like an emerald. Around the throne in a circle were 24 thrones and 24 elders with white robes and golden crowns. And flashes of lightning came from the throne, sounds of peals of thunder. In front of the throne were seven flaming lamps burning the seven spirits of God. If you look at the book of Tobias, you find that Raphael was one. He said, I am one of the seven spirits who stand before the throne of God. You'll get a good comprehensive view of the book of Revelation and a very good commentary by the Navarra Bible. You can order it from us. Then the book of Revelation speaks of the latter days. Mm. Well, there are seven bowls, none of them very good, <laughs> that are going to be poured down on all of us at some point. There you'd be good to read it. It's not what you call happy reading. But it shows what sin is and how the whole world responds and reacts to the sin committed upon it by, by men or mankind. I think we're going to see a lot of things happening in the world. Great catastrophes because the sins of the world. I think, you know when our Lord died, do you remember what happened? There was a great earthquake and it got very, very dark and the earth quaked and the temple curtain was rent in two. You know how thick that curtain was? 
the width of a, the length of a man's hand. That thick. The grapes on it were huge. That thing was rent in two. The sin, the grave sin of betrayal and murder. All, all creation responded with an earthquake and graves opened up and people got up out of those graves. It's in here. I always wonder what happened to them. Did they go back down or did they just keep walking around, you know? <laughs> but anyway, they scared everybody to death, which was the purpose of them coming out. So there is a, a relationship between nature and grave series sit. So, now the book of Revelation is a very exciting book. And I would certainly get all of you who want uh, to know the, a, a very good explanation of the book of Revelation. I get the Navarre Bible. And I think that will give you a great, and it is prophetic. It's symbolic, it's mystical, and it's prophetic. Now, a lot of, pop, a lot of people it, try to interpret it, but I haven't seen really one real good interpretation. We talk about a thousand years. But that's a symbolic of a, an era of peace in the world. So I would, I would encourage you to read it and get a good commentary. We have another call. Hello? Uh, good evening, Mother. How are you? I'm fine. And where are you from? I'm calling from Isla, New Jersey. And, and what is your question? Uh, well, I have a prayer request. Mm -hmm. um, this morning, a parish priest went in for a coronary bypass. Mm. And I would like for you to say a prayer for him. For him, Mother. We should. We will. Thank you very much. Lord Up. God, we just ask that you look upon this, thy son, especially chosen by thee, to be a priest and to take thy place among your people. And so, Lord, I ask that you heal him and give him a new heart, a new spirit, that he may continue his journey home. We ask this in the name and the power of Jesus and Mary. Amen. Amen. Well, do we have another call? Hello? Yes. Where are you from? I'm from Roswell, New Mexico. And what is your question? My question is... Uh, Could you speak was, a little louder, please? Okay, I was wondering, uh, when we baptized uh, one of our nephews and they've changed religions, and I was just wondering what kind of responsibilities we have now. After they're, you know, they're another religion now. Are you, are you the parents or godparents? We're the godparents. You're godparents. Okay, well, your obligation, you know, is to be sure that the child is raised in the church and, and if anything happens to the parents, that he continues to be educated in the church and receives the sacraments. It's a great responsibility. We just think they're going to a party, you know, or you witness something. No, it's a great responsibility to be a godparent because what you're saying is that I, I will be responsible for raising this child and to be sure that they have all the sacraments. So you need to take it seriously and, and, and uh, well, godparents to me are a little bit like grandparents, you know, They're not the same relationship, but there is a an affinity. There's a closeness there. It's just, I always think they're spiritual grandparents. And I, I would consider it like that. Well, would you believe we only got three more minutes? Please don't be disheartened. You are called by God with all your imperfections and sins to be holy. You can overcome with His grace and His Spirit and all the wonderful sacraments in the church. And those of you that are non-Catholic, you can go into any Catholic church and, and, and at least benefit by the presence of Jesus. Just go and sit there and say, Hi, Lord, they tell me you're in here. <laughs> Be simple with God. He likes that. And then just sit there and say, Well, are you? 
don't be surprised if you say here, yes, I am. If you don't hear it, you'll know it in your heart. And even if you're not Catholic, you can benefit by the greatest sacrament. The Lord gave it to us all for our encouragement. Now, just so you'd like to know what else you could do for Lent, <laughs> you can be generous for Lent <laughs> and generous with us because we just thought of one more thing we could do for Jesus. And as soon as we get it started, I'll tell you about it. It's awesome. You'll love it. We have seven services now. All seven cost a little fortune. All together, they cost a big fortune. So I need you to continue. The news, the AM, FM radio, the television, the direct broadcast, uh, the printing, everything that we do. We need you to continue helping us. So please tomorrow or sometime this week, be generous. We want to do even greater things. And as Jesus opens every door, we run through for your sake and most of all for his. Well, we love you. Thanks for being patient with me and my cough and sneezing this morning, this evening. But this is that time of year. And remember, God calls you to be holy. Oh, mm. imagine yourself with a halo. You can. <laughs> well, why not? God made one just for you. So go for it. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow night.